Hi, I'm Bob Spinozzi, and welcome to Small Town. Today's show centers around one of the most brilliant inventions of mankind, the computer. It's the basis for and has improved almost every facet of our lives as we journey through this first part of the 21st century. Computers in earlier times were the size of a large room and required a huge amount of electrical power. Today, they can be as small as a watch. There are many types of computers, desktop, laptop, netbook, smartphone, tablet, and more. And I am so not the person to be talking about computers. But we don't have to search very far, not with the two great segments that we have on our show today. A little later in the program, we're going to meet two Littleton residents, Bill Vales and Per Yurpe. Between them, worked for over six decades in the computer industry before retiring. But first up, we're going to 12 Jennifer Street and visit with Luke Scheminger, the owner of a computer repair and upgrade services business, Littleton PC. Okay, so here we are in Jennifer Street. Luke, thanks so much for being with us today. Of course, thanks for coming in. Okay, tell us how you, how you got started. Certainly. So, um... I've always loved computers my whole life since I was a little kid. My dad was the age that he always had a computer in the house since I was a child. So it's always kind of been my thing, but basically I went to college for a year and a half. Uh, I went to UMass Amherst, and for whatever reason it wasn't for me, but this is kind of what I always wanted to do, work with computers. So I dropped out, came back to Littleton, which is my hometown, and started this computer business with my dad. And how, how long have you been here? I've been here three and a half years now, so it'll be in September will be four years. Okay, so you just kind of, you jumped right in, you said, I'm yeah. going to start my own business, and yeah, took, took and here you are. And it's going well. All right, now you do a variety of repairs here. Absolutely. Tell us about uh, some of those. Sure. So uh, I'll, I'll fix, honestly, almost any electronic device or attempt to, but my main repairs would be iPhones. I fix cracked iPhone screens. I fix PCs, obviously. I'll fix uh, malware. I can fix broken screens. Really, any hardware or software problems. Like if your machine is just acting up or having glitches, I can troubleshoot that. Or if you drop it and actually break something, I can fix that as well. Okay, so really any any uh, any internet problem as well. Right. If you have connectivity issues, if you're at home and for whatever reason you can't get on your wireless well, network. What does that mean, connectivity issues? Oh, sure. So, uh, so if you're having trouble getting onto the internet, or maybe it looks like you're connected, but when you go to do a Google search, it's redirecting you. Anything that, when you try to get to the internet, something's not right. Okay. And uh, really, as, as an aside, uh, you don't just have some a customer come in, drop off a piece of equipment, and give them their ticket and tell them that it'll be ready in a week or two. You actually spend some time with people. I, oh, I hear a lot of people talking about that. Yeah, no, definitely. I, I think initially, as long as I have time that second, I'd always rather the customer kind of fires the computer up, show me what's wrong. I can get a kind of an opinion from them, what they see, as opposed to myself just taking a look at it. If the customer tells me exactly what's wrong, it's, it's really a good head start. And to be honest, a lot of problems I can fix right on the spot. I mean, there's very simple things like you could accidentally hit a switch in your computer, turn the wireless off, and have no idea why your internet's suddenly gone, but with sitting down with you for five minutes, I could fix it on the spot. Okay. Now, it's, uh, it's been reported, uh, through the press at least, that PC sales are down quite a bit. They, they use a 14% figure. Right. And, uh, you know, part of that is because we have such heavy inroads with smartphones and right. tablets. But actually, there are many people who are pretty much content with what they have. Right. I mean, I guess the thing is, computing power, like the actual speed of your computer, has increased to the point where even a few years ago, maybe three or four years ago, computers, as long as you buy uh, maybe a mid-range to a high-end computer, they really last you a long time. Their hardware is made really well, and it's incredibly fast. So there's almost no compelling reason to upgrade. If your machine is fast enough, all they're doing is changing the software slightly and almost making it more confusing for people to learn new stuff. There's really no compelling reason to upgrade, especially because the hardware is so powerful. Yeah, you know, kind of thinking back and people would buy a new computer, right? bring it home, unpack it, the next day, see an ad in the paper, a new bigger and better. <sighs> right. So, right. are we also saying that at that point when we were seeing these 
exponential changes and right. kind of leveled off. And right. And I guess the, the thing is, so there's still increases in processing power. I mean, there's no doubt that the second you purchase something, there's probably something new and better around the corner. But that being said, um, you don't. There's no real reason to upgrade because for basic computer tasks, for going on the internet, for doing Google searches, even for doing business work like opening Excel spreadsheets or Word documents, getting a more powerful processor really won't help you any. You'd be spending extra money and you won't even notice the speed increase. And for the typical person, what they have is probably all they need anyway. Exactly. So. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Now you uh, you. You said something that when, we were, when I came in today, you said that it's not the computer that you have that's valuable, it's the data. Right, and that's the truth. I mean, your hard drive stores all of your data, your pictures of kids growing up, tax documents, really important stuff to people, passwords to get online, and that's kind of interchangeable. You could take that, copy it, and move it to another computer, but that's that, that data that's the most important to people. Your computer itself facilitates using that data. I mean, it lets you access the stuff, but at the same time, it's not that important. As long as you have that data saved, that's really the important thing. Okay, which leads into a very, very important question, the right. issue of malware. Right. Uh, tell everyone about that. So malware is kind of a general term these days used to describe, it used to be known more as viruses, but now virus is a little subset. Malware stands for malicious software, and it's pretty broad. I mean, it could be anything from annoying little pop-ups you see on your computer. So we used to call them worms and Yeah, worms are certainly viruses. a type. Viruses. Yeah, and viruses and all that stuff. Basically, it's just all ways that somebody's trying to get money out of it. Usually they say, we have this great product. You need it or your computer will blow up and pay us 50 bucks. And it gets a lot of people. They, they were so worried about, like we said, your data. People are so worried about their data that they'll pay for things they absolutely don't need. And a lot of us... Uh... <laughs> perhaps open up email that we should. Just, just yeah. this morning I got an email. And it was from AT&T. I have yep. my cell phone is with AT&T. Sure. And I was it's just very suspicious initially. And they did have the first three numbers of my phone number, so I thought, well, yeah. I'll open it up. But yeah. you know, you don't know. Right, and in a way that's such a, I mean, it's a clever scam because the first three numbers of your phone number probably apply to so many people. And so many people also have AT&T that if you blanket a million people with that email, most people maybe it won't work for, but for you, for other people, you might get tricked into clicking it. And truly, emails that have just a little link in it, it's a really easy way to send malware around. You can click that link and in a second be infected. So that's something you really have to be careful about. When you get emails, unless you absolutely know who it's from and that they're sending you something, you have to be really careful. So it sounds like a malware fix is a pretty good part of uh, yeah, the problems be, that you see coming in. It ab absolutely. I mean, maybe probably close to half my business. And another interesting thing is almost everybody that comes into my store for whatever computer problem, you could find some program on their computer that could probably be classified as malware. It's so pervasive through every computer system. Okay. In your window, yeah. just as you walk in, there's a big penguin yeah. sitting there. <laughs> Why? So, <laughs> I like penguins. I have a couple penguins on my desk yeah, as you well. Yeah, you have two parakeets. I do. I have, I have real birds as well. I wish I had a real penguin, but I don't think this is the right environment. But I've always liked penguins. I, I don't have a specific reason. I just love penguins. And another, another interesting tie-in, and believe it or not, if you look at my logo, that's also a penguin. I missed it, actually. It's, it's tough to see, but if you take a look at the logo, it's a penguin looking over a computer. So penguins for computing are also kind of a symbol of open source software. They're kind of like a logo for Linux, which is an open source operating system. And I just think it's quite interesting that there's all these people out there that make free software for everybody. It's great software, and it's free to use. And the penguin is kind of a symbol of that. Okay. Do you have any final thoughts? I'd say... We wanted to. We want. Yeah. Well, first of all, we want everyone to know what your website is. Sure. So your hours here. Yep. My website is. Um, you can do with or without www. But littletonpc.com is the important part. That has my hours there. But I'm here every weekday from nine o'clock until six. Uh, Wednesdays I'm here an extra hour from nine to seven, and Saturdays I'm here from eight o'clock until noon. And 
I guess something that I'd like to add is, even if somebody doesn't have a specific computer problem, if you just have a question, I'm always here, and I'm happy to answer questions from anybody. You don't have to be a customer, just if you have a computer question, you can always come ask it. Okay, that's, that's a great way to end this. Very casual atmosphere here, very informative, and uh, we thank you, Logan. You're welcome. Thanks for coming. Okay. Now we're going to take a look at those products that I mentioned at the beginning of the show. But more importantly, you're going to meet two dedicated volunteers, Bill Vales and Per Yurpe. Per, Bill, thank you so much for being, being with me today. Thank you for having us. Why don't you tell, tell us a little bit about yourselves? Uh, per, let's start with you. Well, um, I've been in the computer industry a fairly long time. Uh, I started to work for digital equipment in 1968. <coughs> and uh, basically retired from the company. And uh, it has been an interesting journey, to say the least, with uh, the mini computer boom and the mainframes, and then finally the personal computers, which really changed the whole industry. Okay, and you, you've seen, well, you've both seen what I mentioned uh, before, where the original ones were so large and cumbersome and used so much energy, and now we're, look how streamlined things are now. Absolutely. Yeah. I too started at uh, Digital in 1968, uh, and I uh, left Digital around 1996 and uh, went to EDS Corporation, did some contracting, and then uh, uh, supported Digital, continued to support Digital products through 2007. So I've been in the computer industry for a long time, 40 odd years, and I agree with everything Pear said, that it's certainly been interesting. And uh, having started at Digital, we were really on the forefront of a lot of the technology. And now, I mean, you're still in computers. You're both volunteering, doing all these great things for, for Littleton. You started some um, classes through the Council on Aging, I believe, last September? Correct, and yeah. you've got some uh, coming up in the fall? Yeah, I, I started to give individual lessons in 2005, and it was Barbara McRae who uh, felt that uh, seniors were in need of computer instruction, or personal computer instruction. So, and I've been doing that since uh, since that time. And then last fall, Bill, um, we started these uh, seminars. Perhaps you want to say a few words about the sure. seminars. Sure. When uh, I became a senior um, and uh, started hanging out at the COA more, uh, I teamed up with Pear to uh, teach uh, some computer classes on a weekly basis. And we started a program um, where we would meet once a week and we would have uh, particular topics we would talk about each week and then we would take questions after that. And the, each session uh, had a different topic. Uh, they lasted for about an hour, and then the uh, questions uh, that extended afterwards would seem to go on another hour or maybe an hour and a half. But uh, we had a, a great following, uh, and we started that in September and uh, went on through uh, May, actually part of June, and uh, we look forward to starting that up again in September. Okay, now, are you, do your classes uh, have all different skill levels, or is it mostly for people who, who are literally beginning to learn how to use computers? or Well, in, in um, the students I've had in my individual classes, there have been a lot of beginners, but there have also been people at different skill levels who want to explore and understand uh, more things, to how they can use a personal computer. I, I assume you've had similar experience. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there, there, there's an absolute range of... Um, of uh, knowledge and also a range of needs. Uh, some people are more concerned with uh, how do I browse the internet? Some people are more concerned with uh, how can I hook my camera up to the computer? So there's a range of needs and a range of uh, talent. And we don't have any prerequisites for the uh, class, you know, uh, other than have an interest and have the time and uh, um, we'll be there to uh, help you. Okay. Yeah. And uh, it would be, I think most of my students, they've had a computer of some kind. Some have laptops, others have uh, what we call desktops. And the issue with uh, 
most of the things you do, but especially with computers, is that you have to practice. <laughs> if you don't use it, you lose it, is what I tell my students. Yeah. And now you brought a whole bunch of uh, products uh, here. Why don't you show us what you have? Okay, well, uh, starting here, uh, uh, we have a, uh, a laptop computer. This is a fairly, um, well, fairly new laptop computer. Actually, it would be ancient because it's almost a year and a half old. <laughs> um, but this is a, uh, uh, a 15 and a half inch uh, uh, screen. And uh, it has a keyboard on it. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a, it's a full-featured system, quite powerful. When I think of the uh, power in this system compared to the systems that I had when I first started working at Digital, this is uh, many tens of times more powerful than what we had at Digital. Actually, hundreds of times uh, probably more powerful in a number of dim dimensions. So. Uh, there is also something called a tablet. And uh, a lot of people are interested in tablets. Now, my tablet is on battery, and it tends to go to sleep. But this just shows uh, the basics uh, that you have a, sorry, that you have an on-screen keyboard that you enter all the text with. And if I click, uh, let me see if I, uh, no. I, I, what I've done is I password protected the startup. So every time it wants to start, it asks for a password. And the way you enter the password, you click on that blinking thing to get this uh, keyboard up, and then you start to type. I'm not going to do that now, but this is just to give you a feel <laughs> for. And the reason I have password protection on all my mobile devices is that in case I forget them or lose them, it will be a little bit more difficult for whoever finds them to try to get into them. It's not a perfect protection because there are ways you can overcome that, but uh, I feel it's helpful. Yeah, yeah I, I would second that about passwords. It's, a, uh, it's really a fundamental technique that we use to protect our uh, machines and, of course, to protect our data because it's really the data that's important. It's not okay. uh, the machines. But another device that we have here Similar to the tablet that uh, Per just showed you, this is an iPad. And uh, this is also a tablet device. And uh, these are great devices for uh, consuming information. So for instance, if, um, uh, if you want to read your email, uh, uh, do a little bit of web, web browsing, uh, this, this is a great tool. You can see here my wife was working on a recipe here. So um, these are real, real neat devices and uh, very handy. But as in all devices, there's not one answer for every need. Okay, so I wouldn't try to write a 100-page document on a tablet. Okay, I might want to read it on the tablet, but I wouldn't want to write it because of the uh, soft keyboard, uh, just as we saw uh, on Pear's device, this also has a soft keyboard. Uh, so it's, it, it can be challenging to do a lot of typing on something like this. The issue of security is uh, something that we all have to be aware of. Uh, things that we shouldn't open, things that come across. What are some of the things that we should really be cautionary about? Uh, email is certainly one area that we uh, should be very cautious about. Uh, I'm sure we all receive uh, email that we don't ask for or we're not expecting to get. Um, this comes under several categories. One category is called spam, okay, or junk mail, okay. Different things are called, uh, the same thing can be called different, different things. Um, uh, we need to be very cautious in the email that we get that it's legitimate email, that just because the email may appear to be legitimate, it may appear to come from your banking institution or your credit card company. Well, give me that example that you gave me yesterday with American Airlines. Uh, okay. 
Okay, I received a, um, uh, a letter in the uh, U.S. mail, and this letter could have, uh, have easily been sent in the, um, uh, through an email. And I was uh, really glad to see that I, I had uh, uh, won some uh, free round-trip uh, uh, tickets. And um, there were several things about this um, uh, email that uh, made, made me aware that it was it was scam. Uh, it was a scam. Um, in fact, having seen a lot of uh, email like this, it, it, it I knew right off the bat. In fact, starting with the envelope, if we look at the envelope, we'll notice that this envelope had no return address on it. Okay, that was one clue. We'll see that it was written, it was handwritten, which was another clue. Yeah, very poorly too, I imagine. <laughs> very poorly and going uphill. Um, uh, a, a third uh, item was, you'll notice that the postage on it, it, it was mailed from Phoenix, which was an interesting thing, but it, but it didn't use a postage meter, okay? It used a stamp, and, and that was a clue as, as well. Now, if we looked at the, um, uh, the letter, the, the letter was very poorly written, uh, and there were some of the content of the letter was uh, uh, contradictory. And uh, it just, um, uh, and probably the biggest thing is the letterhead on this, American Airways, they're not a valid airline. There's American Airlines and there's US Air, but I don't know of any American Airways. Okay, now recently some of these airlines have been, have been undergoing mergers and whatnot. So uh, the scammer is, is certainly making use of the fact that uh, uh, there's some confusion out there of what is a valid airline and what isn't. Um, so what I did immediately when I got this was uh, I did some uh, searching on the internet, some Googling. And um, lo and behold, this came up as a uh, very well-known scam that could be perpetrated through email uh, or, in this case, the U.S. Postal Service. And although this didn't require me to press any buttons or anything, if I had called that number, I would have been subjected undoubtedly to some uh, hard, hard sell sales tactics. And uh, they, uh, you know, they only need one or two people to give up their credit card information and it's home free for the scammer. So those are the things, one, uh, one example of the things uh, we need to uh, watch out for. So, I know Pear has examples of yeah, this also. Yeah, I was also. just gonna ask you, Pear. Uh, yes, especially with email. One of the things you have to be careful about, especially if you don't recognize the sender. And uh, in most cases, I delete emails from people I don't recognize. I take a look in my address book. Is the address in my address book? If it isn't, usually I delete it. Then there are also, uh, if you open the email, and uh, they ask you to click on a, what's called a web address or a URL. Uh, the one issue with the computer industry, we have so many names for the same thing and that it might get confusing. And the issue is that if you, go, if you click on that link, it might thank you, take you to a nefarious site. And how do you know that? Well, one way of doing that is hovering your mouse button uh, your mouse pointer over the address and then if you look at the bottom of your screen does the address that's shown at the bottom of your screen correspond to the address that's shown in this email. Other ones might contain an attachment and say hey look at this funny joke or whatever and you click on the uh, picture or whatever it might be a PDF file and uh, it installs uh, spam or viruses on your machine. So uh, be very, very careful with respect to unsolicited emails. Okay. Now, you mentioned um, terminology. Sometimes, there are several ways to say 
the same thing or something similar, similarly. Yeah. Can you get into that a little bit? Yeah, it is. And you can see that Per and I uh, have been uh, kind of going through that uh, uh, during this interview. Um, for instance, um, we have malware. Okay, and malware is an all-encompassing term for ma malicious software. However, what I think many of us think of as malicious software, we think of viruses. Okay, I need virus protection. Viruses are actually a particular type of malware, so malware is an all-encompassing term. However, when we talk about things, uh, we, we don't need to you know, get that formalized. However, um, th there is a time that you do need to know which, which term is the right term to use. So for instance, types of malware could be viruses, could be worms, could be spam, could be spyware, Trojan horses. Those are all types of malware. But I think in general, you know, you know when we're at the coffee shop, we say, geez, I caught a virus. You know, but, you know, um, what are some other types of... Uh... Well, again, going back uh, to this with terminology, you are probably all familiar with something called a USB stick. Well, that's one of the many names for a, a USB stick. It can also be called a USB memory. It can also be called a portable memory. And... Uh, a flash drive, and the flash drive designation comes from the fact that it contains what's called flash memory. So uh, also thumb drive, uh, sometimes it's called a thumb drive, they, and they all refer to the same thing. And uh, they are very, very convenient, but you really have to be careful, like if you f suddenly find a USB memory, thumb drive, whatever, lying on the street, you probably will pick it up, but be very careful with respect to starting to use it because you don't know what's contained in it. And there have been several stories about uh, uh, people who have picked up this and then their, their computers have gotten uh, infected when they plug it in. And there are also stories about how this has happened with, uh, um, in security circles and with uh, high technology companies and the purpose of this uh, spy very then is to steal as much information as they can from the host company. Right. Okay, we have, uh, we have a couple minutes left. Do you ever shake your head and, and think, my goodness, we've come this far, all these changes have, have occurred since what you said, 1968 I believe? Or I shake my head several times a day. Um, in, in, in many ways we've come a long way uh, uh, in terms of the power of these systems, what they can do. Uh, I, I know from working at DEC, uh, there were several things that we thought of at DEC that we just didn't have the computing horsepower to bring them to fruition. Uh, but a lot of these ideas uh, we thought about and in some ways, I shake my head saying, we really haven't made these much easier to use. <laughs> you know? It just kind of drives me nuts. Well, it's a great way to end because uh, I happen to be uh, struggling with my new Windows <laughs> 8 right now, but uh, I'm getting there. Okay. So. Hey, thank you both very much. Thank you. Well, you're welcome. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Okay. And thank you for watching. I'll see you next time.